you're selling weapons to fishermen and doing a Mumbai style attack. Sign here or, or I'll ruin your life. Crying for me mom like a little boy. I was like, I'm gonna f die in here. I always had my eyes set on joining the army. I had my heart set on trying to challenge myself. If we parked a little bit to the right, I probably wouldn't be here. This prison was built during the British reign. I'm in a cell with 22 of our guys with a hole in the floor. If we had died there, they wouldn't have cared. I'm being nearly accused as a freaking terrorist here. You've been stripped of your freedom. Think you're a big tough guy. You're not a big tough guy now. Hand on your heart, you are an innocent man. What is going on? That's when the pain and suffering begins. This was now me. He says, hey, sort yourself out. You're a paratrooper. It's over. Case acquitted. You have a story which needs to be heard and told. If you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. Today's guest on the debrief then, he spent a bit of time in India. Former member of the Parachute Regiment, but more famously probably known for being a member of the Chennai Six. And here to tell us all about it is Nick Dunn. How are you, buddy? You all right? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Phil. Thank you for <laughs> I'm having good. me. But thank you for coming down, man. I know it's been a long old drive today, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's been a long drive. Got a long drive back, but um, it's worth it. Good. I hope so. Listen... Today we're just going to chat about you as a person, get to know who you are, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of why it is that you became so famous at one <laughs> no point problem. and still are. Yeah. Um, so, young Nick. Young Nick. Yeah, young Nick. Where, where, yeah, where, 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 where have, you're, you're from up north, aren't I'm, you? I'm from Ashton, Northumberland, which I currently still live in. Um, I'm uh, one of three siblings. I'm the youngest. Okay. Uh, I f the bond between me and my mum is uh, special. Um, when I was born, she kind of had to wave goodbye to us because she wasn't too sure if she was going to survive or not. Thankfully, she did. Um, I was one of those kids growing up in and out of mischief, but I'd always be thankful of my uh, upbringing, learning discipline and respect for my elders. Yeah. Um, if I got wrong, I got a clout across the lug or a smacked bum. But... Most importantly, I always had my eyes set on joining the army. Uh, why, why, why was that? But what, I think what? basically when you're a kid and you, you play armies and you see a stick and you'll just picture <laughs> a stick and you'll yeah. the size of the stick dictates what kind of weapon it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. like uh, my childhood, I was always like down the uh, woods making camps. Yeah. I remember pinching my mum's... Uh, Make up all the dark, and then putting and it on, yourself up. coming myself up to <laughs> to play in my little sitting room. You know, I I, I just liked the the way that the army was uh, basically out there. Did you do cadets or anything like that? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, and watching the good old Sunday movies with your dad, the good old black and white ones, and now and again yeah lots of World War 2 stuff yeah. on there weren't there loads of it weren't there so yeah it was, so know. it was it was always steering me into that did you get any of the comics like the, remember the old Commando comics and all that sort of I, stuff I didn't see them but you, you know you're, you're the good old little paratrooper where yeah. you just flew it and, yeah, you, and yeah, you'd just, expect the that's parachute right, to wrap to, him up yeah there he goes and, and my parachute never deployed as a malfunction always, <laughs> it was always a malfunction <laughs> and I've had to I've had to uh, land it in twists Night jumps as well. I mean, so uh, that was probably. You know uh, how that little man feels. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yes. <laughs> um, so school. Were you any good at school? Not really. I didn't. No. I didn't really enjoy school. I, I was. You could say wishing my life away, but I wanted to become older. I I I, I wanted to get out of school and join the army. I wanted yeah. that breath of fresh air. But when I look back at any time of my life. It's always at school. Yeah. They're the times that you never lose. You always, you, you hate it being at school, but it's always the time of your life you always look back on. Yeah, you'll always, yes, you, you, you won't forget it. And, and so you, 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 left, you left school. Yeah, I left school, didn't have the greatest of qualifications. 
I did went you go to, straight into the army? Did you, did I, you go straight I, no, to the careers office? I didn't. Uh, I went to college. I always had it in my mind that, yeah, you can join at the age of 16, but you can't go on operations till you're 18. So I thought, well, I might as well just join at the age of 18. Yeah. At least everything I know that can be thrown at me is in an, as, a, as an adult. Yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. want them to pussyfoot around with us being under that age bracket, which yeah. they probably do at Harrogate to an extent. I wanted to go in right and in the be, deep end. Be, be operationally deployed yes. from day one. You know, exactly, I, I, don't yeah. wanna, I don't want to sit in the sit in the sit in the no. stay behind. I want to yeah, be sort of like off the trot from day one. Definitely one hundred percent. So do you, you you wait until you're eighteen, and did you did you? Did you pick the parachute regiment from day one? Is that where you I wanted did, to go? Yes. Okay. And, I, and how did you know about the parachute regiment? You know, just like you said, the the, the war film, and I did a little bit of research. I, I had me set, me heart set on trying to challenge myself. Yeah. Because I'm not the tallest of uh, guys, so I always had that as growing up. Yeah. Not getting bullied or anything. Just I wanted to be a bit taller and I, and I know that could never happen. So yeah. I want to try something that can push me. And I just did a bit of research. What's the best the army can provide? Parachute regiment. Obviously, the careers office was always trying to sway me towards the fusiliers with my local regiment and all that. But I don't think a feather duster looks good on my head. <laughs> so, so you weren't having that. Well, I wasn't having that. that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you don't want that. I don't. I don't want the the heckle or whatever it's called. Yeah. The heckle. But I, I, the, when I every time I looked on you know books or anything the history, and I saw like the parachute regiment, I was thinking, especially when you look back at uh, World War Two in particular, yeah, every man an emperor, all yeah. that sort of stuff. And you look at Arnhem, which is obviously just recently happened if you go back in time yeah and I, I looked at that and you know you see the film a bridge too far and it just it just bored well it just put me in that so you, you were know, pretty much sort of right. in that you, direction it, it was sold it's interesting because i didn't really think about joining the army and i just i just went with what i was directed to do you know what i mean yeah and they will direct you where they want you won't they do you know yes, what i mean definitely, so that's it. And definitely. yeah a bit of research might have been different for me i i, I did all my stuff subsequently when i got in like do you know what yeah, I, mean? and yeah. I was quite lucky but yeah, I suppose if you, you know, as a young lad, if you, if your mind was set on that, oh, there yeah. was no talking you out of it, was there? No, no. Uh, and the good thing about when I joined, it, it was I remember, like I say, being in college when the invasion of Iraq. Obviously, I was in high school, and I, you know, se- September 11th, we'll all, we'll always remember yeah. that day, whatever happened in our lives, like it was yesterday. Yeah. But it was when I was in college. And it was to, and it was after the you know seeing it all on the news crossing the border into Iraq and all that and I was thinking let's get me still going yeah uh, I, need, I need a bit of that I, I want a, some I of want that. some of that <laughs> you know that was the gateway so you did depot at a time when the army was at war yes so there was there a lot of emphasis you know we we had Northern Ireland when I was in depot but that was about as lucky as you were going to get like do you know what I mean mm. so. You were you were joining and you were thinking right, and if Afghanistan kicked off when you was in yeah, depot, yeah, yeah. So you had Afghan and Iraq going at the same time. So you're yeah. thinking, I'm definitely when I come out of here, my trigger finger is going to be up and down like a lunatic. And I went to Northern Ireland first. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so, and it was like nearly six six months of rain. Really? So you did a quick Northern but, Ireland tour. Yeah, yeah, we did a quick Northern Ireland tour. It was like the last ever parachute regiment, or at least where was it? Belfast. Para. Uh, north, uh, south of Mar. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So you did all the yeah, Bezbrook, Bezbrook, Bezbrook Mill, Mill and all yeah, those sorts of places. Yeah. yeah. That, it was an experience. Yeah. It, it, quite a, a strange, ha- harrowing experience for myself because I hadn't joined my company. I hadn't done pre-deployment training. I was just rock. So you literally got your wings and Peng- went almost no. straight. You didn't got your wings. I was pen- penguin cutting oh. around. Oh, that must I got have been me, I got my wings halfway through Northern Ireland. It was just, but like seeing the guys come back off pre-deployment training, and and yeah, I was like, I was shit myself basically. Yeah. I was like, I'm in the big boys now, and that's when it just hits you. You yeah. think, have I actually made the right decision? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's blokes covered and caked and shit, covered in cam cream. Angry, 
there's just been on exercise for God knows how long, and I'm fresh-faced, little 18-year-old, shitting myself. I was thinking, if you're going to be a grizzly, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly, in it. So yeah. I'm glad I made that decision. So you did. You got your Northern Ireland tour out of the way. Yeah. Did you spend any time in... You'd have been in Colchester then, would you? Surely, no, you we're, know, we're, we're in uh, Dover for a bit. Okay. And then we transitioned to St. Athens. Okay. So mm. it was a... An event, get, getting all the stuff from one camp to another. Yeah. You you, you know you're going to be in a, a a daft that breaks down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the journey adds another like 10 hours onto it or something. But well, I, yeah, I spent most of my time in St. Athens, big big camp. Um, and then you, you're going through the transition on the different mirroring of what uh, special forces do. Doing your yeah CT role counterterrorism. Yeah. Terrorism. I enjoyed that. I liked that. Yeah. Hard, you know, especially when you you know fast roping from yeah. a chop out onto a moving vessel. I enjoyed that. And They're good skills, aren't they? Yeah. yeah and it's, it, and it's, you're getting assets. You're yeah. asset rich in in what you're doing, aren't it's, you? So it's, it's great. Not like your normal military training. Yeah. It's something advanced, and then you you're doing your pre deployment training, and it's not your conventional green role yeah. type of soldiering. So, th- like I said earlier, I wish I was older and I joined the Powershirt Regiment earlier, so I got the be- best of both. Yeah. I, d- I didn't really see much green role. Right, so you went straight into this SFFG uh, Well, rock. well uh, just on the verge of it. As it was becoming that. Yes, yeah. I didn't get to see... But, you know, hearing all the stories from all the other people and stuff like that, um, it was like, you feel like you've missed out, but you yeah. don't realise you've got so much to come. So did you do did you do Iraq and Afghanistan? I did, yeah. You did. And it, it, great time or? Um, Afghanistan, well, I was in a Wimmick and we got blew up. I was top gunner. It was pressure plate. We, we got dicked. So we went to investigate, came back and parked up. And yeah. boom. I was, like earlier on that op, there was a few of our vehicles hitting mines. We yeah. got more indirect motor fire. And I'm like, I think 21 at the time. And I honestly, my arse 50 like that. I was yeah. thinking, <laughs> 50 per yeah, pound. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, and, when, and then people are just cutting around going, ah, it's nowhere. It's nowhere near, man, the, with the indirect motor fire. And I'm like, I'm flapping like a little budgie here. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? Yeah. You know, but it's an experience. Yeah. And, and it, did you pick up any, inj- to sustain any injuries from I that? didn't. No? None of them did. Um, thankfully, the the Land Rover was all kitted out, but it was a pressure plate and it right. went straight up the engine block. Um, 105 so pretty lucky shell. Then. Pretty yeah, lucky then, really. Pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. lucky. Um, the downside about it is it was pretty fresh. Um, and when the guys came with the metal detectors, just to the right of her, there was something a lot larger, and they put it down to an anti-tank mine. So if we'd parked a little bit to the right, I probably wouldn't be here. You'd probably got, yeah, you'd have got both. You'd, been, have, you'd have double whammy, didn't yeah. you? Been, yeah, you'd have been. But, you know, but you, you, when you watch the movies and you hear stuff, you think, oh, is it like that? But... When you're actually in that situation yourself, the only thing you can kind of say is the same or similar is when everything slows down yeah. and goes into slow motion. It does, it does, it, does. it generally does, it, yeah. It, yeah, 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 yeah. It, literally, yeah. it literally does. The first time I got blown up was in Northern Ireland it was by a bar, and it was literally, I, I remember it like my, my chest sort of like imploded. It felt mm. like it, I was having all the air sucked out of me, but everything around me is like, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's probably, quick. Yeah, 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 there's yeah. none of this, oh, there's a bomb, I yeah. best get, you, yeah. you just don't know. It's just, boom, massive yeah. dust cloud. I've spanked in, lying on the in the back of the Wimmick, uh, he has both ringing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And but stuff coming out of the sky because I remember yeah. crawling under the vehicle when I could. There's got big lumps of concrete. You could, oh, you yeah, left a big, ding. bit old, big old crater, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the engine block was just yeah. destroyed. Um, but like I say, thankfully no one got injured. Um, but it was just, it's just one of those times where you think I'm lucky. 
Yeah, yeah, you're in the glad to be alive club yeah. for sure. So you did it. You did Afghanistan. You did Iraq as well. I did Iraq. Did you get up to much out there? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think I'll be allowed to say much, but obviously we were in Baghdad. Yeah. Where J Squadron. Okay. Mm. Sorry, Day Squadron, uh, Hereford. Good, massive uh, learning curve. Yeah. Seeing how, basically mimicking what... Because now you are in that support yeah. role. You are... You, 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 did, were you kicking doors in or were you sort of like cording? S- we, actually, we were doing the cording. I spent yeah. most of the time doing the, like, all the DNA stuff on yeah. the cording, with the cording team and all that. It was quite a... Um, it was one particular job where, obviously, unfortunately, the the guy didn't surrender and, uh, well, need I say more, you know what happens. Yeah. And seeing all the women and children and the kids are outside screaming, they don't know anything, but the women, they know they're with bad men and they're not bothered. And they just think, well, I'm alive. Yeah. Um, the turps on the megaphone saying, drop your weapon and your lots all on the ladders and just it all just opens up and then you just think sounds like music to my ears that <laughs> and then when the dust settles you're told to go in and do all the dna and i remember me me tl went donny donny go, go swab his mouth and i got the swab kit and i was like uh don't know where his mouth is. <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> well, just pick something. I was like, all right, okay. And I just picked a bit of flesh up and just swabbed it. And I was thinking, this is this is mega. <laughs> yeah. No, this is mega. Like, just oblivious. Yeah. Um, I used to wear contacts at the time. And I lost one of my me, me contacts, which was me, me right eye. So I've got ladders. <laughs> with one eye I'm thinking I hope we don't get, come under attack because I'm buggered yeah, I can't <laughs> I'm just, see I'm going to have to pray and spray <laughs> yeah pray and spray yeah because it was my right contact lens oh so, dear. oh yeah but like I say you have some uh, good times you have some bad times um, they, were, they were potentially going to send back to Afghanistan halfway um, but they managed to get the rest of the tour down uh, in Iraq instead of swapping halfway through. Yeah. Because there were, there was a discussions whether British forces could operate. Uh, they were on about cannon that. Um, but I think we're sweethearted the Yanks and the Iraqis. But the Americans, when you see what they've got, man, and you see what we've got, you can tell our blokes appreciate when they get something Gucci, when they yeah, get yeah, something they get nice, beach. shiny, shiny, yeah. <laughs> they'll either destroy it or they'll end up selling it yeah. or they'll just try and deny they had it so yeah. it doesn't get put a, a serial number so put on it. Off them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, but the Americans just, honestly, the amount of stuff kit. they get is unbelievable. Yeah, 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 crazy. So how long did you do in the, in the, in the parachute? Uh, six, yeah. I, okay. I, I would little prefer to do a lot longer, but it was the time when I got to that point, everyone was just, leaving to do CP or maritime. Is or that anything. what lured you out to do the CP? Because, I mean, yeah. I, I, I got, you know, guys are obviously, we see serving soldiers all the time When because I, I was in Iraq, you know, loads. And yeah. It, you know, you're telling them and they're asking you what you're being paid and you say, well, we're doing all right, lad, do you know what I mean? And they know you're getting some quite big money. Oh, so, yeah. So was that sort of like a, a big draw for blokes to get at? Yeah, I think after Northern Ireland, that's what kind of took a lot of our people from our battalion yeah. to Iraq and uh, Afghan and various places. Um, I, w- I was nearly heading to Afghan, but then there was a bit of discrepancy with me not having a driving license at the time. Yeah. Uh, I was banned, so the Yanks were a bit whingy. Like that. I was like, oh, God. And then obviously it just came up to go on the ships, and I thought, I'm qualified for both. So did you do any of these courses when you got out of the military? Did you? Yeah, you, yeah. Which ones did you do? I did, obviously, my CP. Okay, and, who, who uh, did you do it with? I did it with uh, with Brian Tuff. Okay. And uh, was so Nick many McCarthy cool, and all there was, that. There were so many courses at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, I've... I've and did, did you do everything? So you did CP, maritime, the whole lot in a while. Yeah. So you got fully carded up. Yeah, yeah. SIA I, I, badge. Everything. The, the whole shoot. Basically, everything on the table. And then just, 
as you do. Yeah. If when you're applying for a new job, you just bombard everyone. Yeah. And then you you know I've 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 covered everything. Yeah. I, I wasn't just going to say oh we'll just do CP and we'll not do maritime. I will whatever came first I'll take. Yeah 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 yeah. And cool. obviously unfortunately, well I say unfortunately, fortunately you know, uh, maritime. Okay, so you first you first who were you working for with the maritime stuff? Can you say? Um, I was working for various companies before okay. I, my last company when it all went tits up. Okay, so, so we'll get to that. But did you? I mean, I was doing the transits and all sorts, and I yeah. did have quite a good laugh on some of them. But pirates were full of few and far between. Yeah. Weapon, weapons were even fewer and further between. You know what I mean? We were yeah. doing most of it unarmed in, in, when I first started doing. Well, they it, tried like, to get I mean? me to do a couple of unarmed transits uh, for the night for Nigeria and stuff like that. Now I, I was like. I don't trust. Nah, I couldn't. Yeah, I've done the Nigeria stuff. You have to have the policemen on the boat yeah. and they're brassing everything up. They can, anything that comes near it, they're brassing up. You spend more time pulling them off the end of the ship than what you <laughs> do can, looking for pirates. Uh, like I say, even on the Horn Horn of Africa, and you've, we've all seen the videos and you just think, you know, if that was British, they'd be in front of a court of law going down. Yeah. But these people from wherever they were, I think you can kind of gauge where they are from their voices. Zero fucks given. Yeah. And you just think, um, and that's why you get a people who basically characterise you all as the same. And I'm yeah. like, hang on, we may do the same job, but our professionalism is a higher standard than them cowboys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah They're yeah, the yeah, ones yeah. that's given us the bad name. You yeah. know? So... Let's let's talk through the transit where you where you obviously went went down the pipe. <laughs> you set off on a normal transit. Where where where, where were you going from and to? Uh, we embarked in Muscat in the Oman. Okay, and yeah, we yeah. were meant to go to Sri Lanka. Okay, two so days straight south. Yeah, journey straight south down the thing. Yeah, yeah. Two days into the transit, RTL got an email saying. Basically, the company is going to uh, save a bit of money, not get the pilot boat, but have our uh, company vessel. So we're going to board that, which is just like basically a ho- uh, floating armory, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um. So after about five, six days, we boarded that. Um. Few of our teams were coming on, leaving, and then after that. We decided that was it. We're going to cease operations. Everything gets locked away, stored away. Only two people have access to the armory, and that's the captain and the TDO, the tactical deployment officer. And that was it. We're, we're off to get uh, fuel, food and provisions for our vessel because we were uh, at a point where, we, you know, if we went another month, we'll be on the bones of our house, so we we'll definitely need to get okay. st- uh, stuff. Because you don't know how long you're going to be on there. Do yeah, you? you're right. Yeah, the dollar changes and the, the freight goes somewhere else. Don't exactly. You? you can end up chasing all around the ocean with it, can't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, did what you do. Chill out, sunbathe, fish. See some crazy fish that you've never even seen before <laughs> on the India line. A couple of squid. Big old Dorados and oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Pull, pulling them in on a hand line. <laughs> Great uh, time. Plenty of squid squirting all over the shop. Just give it to the, sh- the chef. Yeah, Cook yeah. that for me tea, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was just life yeah. on the sea. You know, people always said to me, "Don't expect being on a fantastic ship all the time." I said, "I was in the parachute regiment. We're not used to getting good gifts. <laughs> We're used to <laughs> the bare minimum of everything." Yeah, but utilize what you've got. Yeah, um, so. But, you know, the weather started changing, waves, and apparently there's a, a cyclone. So uh, in the maritime law, in such times where there's cyclones, etc., you can seek shelter in a neighbouring country. Okay. That neighbouring country... What sort of ship were you on? What sort of ship was it? Was a it a little, big ship? Or one of those coaster type things? Yeah, like a Coast Guard kind of yeah, 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 old yeah. navy. Yeah, so was it wasn't it? a big ship. Was it wasn't no. like a tanker or anything like that. No, it was like I think fifty footer. Oh, okay. 50. All right, so it wasn't that big at all. It wasn't okay. that big. No. Yeah, cool. 
Um, so you decided then, basically, cyclones come in, we'll, we'll, we'll side left and we'll go into India yeah, and take a bit of cover. Yeah, and under maritime law, you can seek shelter yeah. through uh, that little loophole, so to speak, if there's a cyclone, et cetera, or, you, you know, you, you've got yeah. your air nets tangled and your propeller, whatnot, whatever. Under maritime law, you can seek shelter, and that's what we're doing. And we were transporting the fuel and provisions. I think it was like 11.30 at night. I said to the TDO, oh, I'm off. See you later. And then that's it. And then we get a, a rude awakening. And then the TDO's waking everyone up, saying, just to let you know, we've been boarded by the Indian Coast Guard and we're uh, under gunpoint making our way to the port of Tutukurin. And we're like, oh, ah, okay. I wasn't uh, One obliv- bothered. One bothered I was, I was, no, because in this part of the world, in this job, you get stupid <laughs> things like this, yeah, yeah, where they'll yeah. go, oh, your passport's a bit frayed. Right, how much to make it go away? Ah, $4,000. Oh, cool. That's an expensive passport. You know, <laughs> anyone who's done... Uh, Maritime or CP, when you were abroad, you, you'll always come across some chancer, and yeah. they've they hold your green ticket, and you just, and that's what we thought it was. Yeah. And for where we were to port was an hour and a half away, max, at ten to twelve knots. We were going two knots. Right, okay. This was taking a long time. I questioned why are we going so slow. And he goes, "I don't know. He'll not speak to us. He'll not speak to the captain. This guy on the bridge, from the coast guard, weapons, not interested." And we were getting closer to the port, and we were welcomed with a a welcome committee. A easy. Sp- counted didn't even need to count you could easily just say a minimum of 50 people and that's not including the the staff that works there that this was police from different units right, okay. and a high media presence all port media side. as well yeah port side so now, are you thinking now right this is going a bit pete tong yeah you you, <laughs> you, you, you i was just thinking what is going on now? And we docked gangway. There you go. And all the police were just running on and we had to form some sort of order. And a few people, oh, you can't do that. You know, you're going to upset them. And like, if they keep running onto this vessel, we'll be capsized. That's how silly they were. They were and we had to literally say, look, we don't know who you are. You're not showing what identification. You're not getting on the vessel. Please comply. You know, the good old head wobble and just blanky and just... Yeah, pff, do what they want anyway. Do what they want anyways. And yeah. you're like, right, okay. So we were just basically told to just keep out the way, but surrender your passport and your discharge book for your same, for your maritime documentation. And then that was it. A few people got questioned. Um, I never... And then after four days being portside, um, not new, allowed off or nothing like that. Numerous, new, we weren't allowed off. No, we no. aren't. You know, well, we already informed the company, already informed the British Embassy. They apparently couldn't get access to her. You know, read what it, read between the lines with that. We did question the, the embassy on that, and they said yeah. they couldn't get access. I'm thinking, well, did you not pursue it? Yeah, just, just pitch up. Yeah. <laughs> How about you just come down and see us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, after four days, a big four-tonner, wait, like two four-tonners turned up, a load of armed guys, and we thought, this isn't going well. Especially when during one, day one or day four, it's constantly 24 hours. And you get no sleep in your oh, passport to different or police organisations, and I mean, 
as far as Mumbai. So someone's told, I even was questioning, I'm thinking, hang on a minute, something's not right here. Why is people from Mumbai here? Why is people from, I think, New Delhi? Yeah. Not just the local cowboys, big people. And then apparently they were going, ah, there's nothing to be had here. Showing the weapons. We never denied hiding any weapons, but their media from the local boys said they found them. Well, you didn't. You were showing them. But after day four, they removed all 35 weapons because they said we might use them. Right, okay. I'm thinking, all right, okay. Sundance kid, eh? You know... Butch Cassidy and Sundance, the final, the final uh, throw. I don't think that's going to happen. We're professional outfits here. We're not idiots. We're not going to yeah. go arm ourselves with uh, single shot weapons and <laughs> try and take on a, a military. Don't be daft. And then two days later, so that's six days at port. It was, uh, I think, six, seven o'clock in the morning because at the time it was four and a half hours ahead. So back in the UK, it must have been about between three and four in the morning. Obviously, my family were all aware because there was already rumour reports online saying we're apparently doing a Mumbai-style attack. And my dad questioned me. He says, right, I'm reading this. Your mum and me's quite worried. You said you're protecting, you're doing security. I said, yeah says, well, that's not what we're reading online here. You're selling weapons to fishermen and doing a Mumbai-style attack. I was like, no, I'm not. Discard that. That's false. And he goes, I want your yeah, promise. Are you up to any dodgy business? Because you're on your own if that's the case. I went, no, this is legitimate. Something's not right. And he went, right, okay, you've got our support. And I just after that phone call, I was like, "What the fuck are these assholes saying?" And then, and yeah, the, you must have been racing there. You must have been thinking, "I was like, thinking, I'm getting geez, nearly told, I'm I'm being nearly accused as a freaking terrorist here." Yeah, 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 yeah. And we've got Indian crew, you know, and they were tread awful, awful, because they were like aiding the betting in their eyes. Yeah. Um, and then they, and then obviously got to that where the two. Buses turned up and they said, yeah, you're going to the hospital for a checkup, but you can't take your wallet, you can't take your mobile phone, you can't take, if you're wearing a belt, you can't wear a belt. Some guy couldn't take his reading glasses. So he's like, can't see. <laughs> it was just a madness. And the TDO went, right, lads, you know what's happening. Let's not uh, beat around the bush. We're all blokes at the end of the day. Suggest you get your phone calls made now because we're going to prison. And what were you thinking at this stage? You're thinking, you know, how could it get that wrong? It, it, my head was racing, my heart was pounding. I was thinking, hang on, I've, I've been to India before, but not like this. So I was ringing my sister, mind the time difference. Sister, the never answered. I don't have many regrets in my life. I wish my mum never answered this phone. I really do. And the reason being is because it's the last time she ever spoke to me before suffering a double aneurysm, where she can't speak properly. And I had to tell my mum, who's in and out of sleep, that it's gone tits up. Mm. I'm not coming home. Wow. I yeah, don't so know when you'll it. next see me or hear from me, but I love you. Take care. I'll do I'll do what I need to do. And that was it. And I went, ma'am, I've got to go. At least I was ringing us back. I went, the shit's happening. Get the embassy now. I'll speak to you later. Bye. I love you. Short, simple, to the point. Mm. Not at three, four o'clock in the morning, my sister wants to hear. But I know for a fact 
they were okay. This was now me. I had to blot my family out as best as I could. Yeah. Because I, if I let my feelings overpower me, it's going to make my situation 10 times harder. Because emotions make you feel weak. Yeah. And you're going to bring all that in with you. Yes. So I had to just discard that. And then that was it. Like, you're about to leave your phone and you put it on the table and everything gets locked on the ship and you go on the bus and there's two police armed police officers per one person and there's 35 of us. So a hot, two buses and then equal. You're, you're cramped. You've got weapons. You don't know the state of their weapons. We're not even handcuffed. And the, the barrels are all over and we're like, I'm just thinking, if we hit a bump in the road, a round's going to go off. So you hadn't had you hadn't got time to think your family of the situation. You were thinking, yeah. I hope I don't die in this freaking bus. Because <laughs> apparently we're going to the hospital. We didn't go to a hospital. We went to the court. Wait, we went to the police station, sorry. Blues and twos. Media hanging out their cars trying to get pictures of her. It was just... The the weather started warming up. Southeast India. Anyone who's been there, it's a minimum thirty degrees, yeah, thirty five. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a sweat box. Goppingly hot. <laughs> oh, it's gopping. and like where we were in Tutankhamun, I don't think they've ever seen white people before. So when they saw us, it was just like we were like a, a an attraction. That's how it felt. Yeah, and we we're all chucked in this tiny little room, and. No water. I think we're given a bottle of water each. No food. Nothing. We had uh, no agent. Agent, he disappeared. Someone from the company had turned up, but then there were, he apparently got a hot collar and disappeared because they were going to arrest him. We're like, where's our embassy? We've got no lawyer, and the police are interrogating us. Sign here or, or we'll ruin your life. And I'm like, it's a blank piece of paper. I'm signing nothing. And it was like that. And it was getting close to tea time. And the woman in charge of the investigation, we were all called a Madame Q Branch because that was the organisation Q Branch anti-terrorist uh, unit. So if they're involved, they're obviously claiming we're terrorists. Yeah. And she was making her mouth go... So we all had to get on the buses again. We got to the court, but we arrived a little bit late. We all got off the bus, went around the back. Some guy in a suit came out, said something in uh, Tamil, got back on the bus. And then we went to the Hotel California, the first prison uh, in Palum County. And we got there about 11 o'clock, half 11 at night. And when you looked at this prison, this prison was built during the British reign. Wow. That's a, what this, it was proper grim looking. You, you looked at the gates and you just thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in here. Yeah, I, and I'm just thinking, what on earth is going on? And obviously you couldn't see things with it being at night time. So we all got bundled. We got where we were little bl- two blankets, uh, a spoon, a metal mug, and a dog bowl plate thing. And then that was all. All chucked in this big outhouse thing with this hole in the floor as a toilet and a like a, a water trough to wash. And it was just like metal bars, bland. You wouldn't even think it was a prison without if they didn't have metal bars. That was, you know, and then it's one of the worst noises I'll ever hear. And it's the noise that always sends shivers down my spine. And that's when the prison door shuts and they hear the keys clanking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when reality hits. Yeah. That's when the hairs on your, your back of your neck and your arms stand up. That's when the pain and suffering begins. That's when your family comes into your forefront and you're saying no. 
because I need to focus. I need to get my head around what is going on and your emotions and your and you feel like just exploding, but you've got to stay calm and you just you just sat there and you're just thinking. What now? And you've got no idea how long you've been charged for, what you've been charged with, how long you're going to be there for. Have I got a sentence on my own remand? You've got no idea at nothing. this stage. It was nothing. About you've got no nothing. idea. You could no be idea. There for, you could be there for, you hear horror stories, don't you? Be, yeah. You know, these places, oh, you've been on remand for 27 years, mate. You know, you know you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. It's a totally different uh, kettle of fish. Their judicial systems are abroad compared to here in the UK. Um. And then when daylight happens and you kind of get let out, you just see the rest of the prison and you see all the Indians hanging out their windows and you just, the reality stick hits you. You think you're a big, tough guy. You're not a big, tough guy now. You've been stripped of everything. You've been stripped of your freedom. Mm. That's what hurts the most. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's nothing you can do about it, either, is there? Nothing. Especially when you know you, you've done nothing wrong. Yeah. Heart, heart, hand on your heart, you are an innocent man. And you've had your freedom taken away. That's the most despicable thing I think they can do to someone. But obviously, apart from torturing someone to death. But that, to me, was equivalent. Yeah. I've just lost everything. I was like in someone's hand and my life was dictated by theirs. So what happens now? Where, where were you going to now? Did, did, did you start to find stuff out? Did uh, you start to the sort next, like, were people telling you? Did... We, everything was just, phew, even the prisons were just, whoa, what's going on here? Like they've never seen white people. First, When they found out there was six British here, they were nearly doing cartwheels, man, in the prison. Because where we were, was so anti-British. They yeah. can't comprehend that we ruled them. They despise the British, the South East, and the local prisoners told with us, says, you're going to get it hard because they hate you. And, I, and we were just thinking, just keep your head down. And it's, it is hard to not lose your shit. Did anybody, did you experience anybody like coming to give you a bit of a hard time? Did you have uh, to... Did... Way, uh, there is a story of me kicking off and I just lost my emotions and basically I started a brawl in the hospital and then we ended up being in a three-month compound lockdown. So I was obviously flavour of the, the flavour of the group. But uh, we got the embassy to come in and we were just like, and they were in the dark. We're like, we don't even know what's going on. Can you tell one? Well, and obviously the guy we just let the TJ let him crack on, and I was, and then at the end she went, "Look, your f- families are." He has some paper. Write your initial family, and I, you know you've got so much to say, but when that piece of paper and that pen's given to you, you you your mind because yeah. you're like, how do I not worry my family? I'm fine. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. I, I, so I, I kind of had to tell her a white lie just to protect my family because I was in the dark as much as them yeah, and I'm yeah, living yeah. it. My nightmare's now begun for how long? So I just had to keep saying, look, don't worry about me. I'll, I'll you know, keep it together. Um, And that's why I do mention, you know, about... I'm so grateful that I've got my military training because of what the military does to you. To when you know if times of adversity happens, you know how to act. Mm. And when you've got nothing left, you can always try and cling onto that little bit of hope. There's always a chance. You, if you yes. can make a millimetre gain on anything, there's always a chance. 100%. In there. you know, while, while this is going up and down, yeah. and there's a bit of air in me, I'm like, well, I could always turn this around, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes, as much as you don't want to play the, their game, you have to. If they say jump, how high? Yeah. You know, just to help you. And even they were saying, help you, help us, blah, blah. So how long was it before you sort of like got sentenced or had an idea of what you were actually going to be looking at? Months. 
we were in prison for about three, four months with no charge. Right, we were okay. cut, we were, so we were shifted up. The Indians stayed in Palam Koti, but they shifted us 23 foreigners up to the Raman prison in Chennai, Puzal Central Prison 2. And honestly, <sighs> what a prison. Wow. We, we saw other foreigners like uh, Nigerian uh, drug dealers, uh, Syrian meth dealers, just the odd person just extending their stay and forgetting their visa. You know, people like that. Um, Tamil Tigers. They all knew us. They all read, were reading their papers before we even... You know, we came through, the, through night time. 14-hour bus journey. It was... I was on sh- I was on nerves for fourteen hours. Because did, did you, you ever think in- about did you ever think about trying to escape? Or like, was that going through the back of your mind? Did you ever oh, think, we could have easily I- escaped. We would just batter the Indian police and just pinch their guns and run <laughs> run away. But 35, 23 white people would stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll get some. You'll get some eventually, won't you? Oh, <laughs> we, we, where we where we were wasn't uh, like a. It's not like Goa. Where there's or Mumbai, where there's more Western people there, yeah. so you can kind of blend in. We and we w- hadn't a hope in hell, so you just go right, just grin and bear it. Yeah, you would have been grassed up at every junction there, wouldn't you? There's, there would have been nobody to harbour you, nowhere to hide, nowhere to go. I'll tell you what, can we just stay here for a couple of days and then we'll then we'll get you out wake, of here. You go to see where got yeah. the police will be there. Yeah, but uh, we we'll, like I said, we got the Roman prison and like. The embassy starts to come and say we're every fortnight, we're letters from your family. And you just, you don't know what to say. You're like, me mum and me, like, me sister and me dad having kittens and they're writing it in words and I'm like, I kind of deal with this. Well, I, I, I met your sister fairly yeah, early yeah. on with some of the campaigning, yeah. so, you know, I, I was seeing that side of things. And, I, I you can't know. comprehend, like, how do I write back? What do I, like, I'm in a I'm in a cell with 22 of our guys with a hole in the floor and a book, a couple of buckets to swirl what it away. Of, what sort of food were you getting? The food in the remand prison was beg, borrow and steal. we are doing extreme dieting. In the six months we were there, we I've got at home, which was done by someone else. All of our weight loss, I've never re- revealed a lot of the the whole. I've got a whole year and a half. Their media saying, yeah, their their top admiral saying they've got were and all like got who do you think we are? The food, potatoes, carrots, onions, green beans, and measly chicken neck and wings at first sometimes and this was just you know you imagine trying to feed 23 people we we made ourselves little food teams we're not gordon ramsay we're not chefs we just tried our best majority of the food would be like a stew I'm sure we gave ourselves uh, food poison cuz oh, I thought I was going to die in there just lying there in your cell, sweating because of the heat, and you just feel your stomach gurgling. And I, would, during the day when we're in the prison, we never used the inside toilet. We used to use the outside toilets, just to keep it fresh a bit, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then I was lying there, and we'd all gone down. It was like a hot knife through butter. How quick uh, D and V can spread. In that, co- in that, in those environments, in the yeah, environments. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fuck. If one person gets it, you've all got it. There's yeah. no way to hide. You can't hide. And I was, I was lying there, and I, I, I need to go to the toilet. And I was walking, and I, I puke up, and then I fart and I shit myself, and I just start. I, was, I just cry, crying for me, ma'am, like a little boy. I was like, I'm gonna fucking die in here. Mm. I'm die. I'm gonna die in here. Now one of the one of the Estonians, he had a stomach ulcer. He was he was rolling around in pain at night time, and the guards were like, Ugh. "If we had died there, they wouldn't have cared." Uh, just you got dra- dragged off. We've seen it. Buried and uh, the way the, the, the one person died on the on the table, sheet over him, left by the front door. 
for the ambulance to come and pick him up. Just like that. Unbelievable. Like, one of the guys um, were all, like, receiving letters from the embassy and one of the, the embassy girls says to one of the lads, oh, can you stay behind? And then we went and whatever. And he came back and he goes, oh, me, me dad and me, me partner's coming out to see us. And then time went by. So was this was October. We're not charged. Christmas comes. New Year comes. Like, I don't know what's going on. My family's withholding. I didn't hear. And the embassy comes. And they say, Nick, can you stay behind? And I'm like a Cheshire cat here. I'm buzzing. I'm like, someone's come to see us. I'm buzzing. And I'll never forget the face on Sharon, the embassy girl, when she handed me letter. She she saw us buzzing and she looked and she went, I can't do this. You're going to have to read this, Nick. Even Sheaf didn't know how to handle it. And I don't know what this letter was saying, but it was just, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. She's all right, she's all right. And it's my sister and I'm like, what's going on? And it was about my mum. She was in the hairdressers five days before Christmas and she suffered a double aneurysm. Uh, I think it was due to the stress mm. of what was going on with me. I think that just set the wheels in motion and it just destroyed us. I felt ruined, ruined. I was like, I'm in the prison on the other side of the world here for a crime I've not committed, and now I've just been told my mum's lying in the hospital bed fighting for her life. What do I do? What do I do? So I, I leave the jailer's office where we used to have our embassy meetings, and I was in a tunnel, and the red mist is coming down. I'm getting pelted by stones off the local population prisoners. A few flowery words I could understand. You know, racial slurs, 100%. But the pain I was going through didn't even match what they were trying to inflict on me. I had to walk nearly a mile to the our compound. And I was dragging my feet. And I got to the compound and I saw the TDO. And I broke down and he took us away. I said, I can't do this. Fuck this, no way can't do this and he grabbed us and he gave because he was ex-reg as well and he gave us a slap he says hey sort yourself out you're a paratrooper dig deep your family don't want to see you like this and you know what it hit us it hit us hard and I was like you know what I can't let them get away with this I'm not going to let them beat me I'm going to rise above everything. I'm going to do it not for myself, but I'm going to do it for my mum, my family. And just, I'm innocent. I've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing. Mm. But I'm in prison. For, you know, what am I meant to do? How how do you comprehend this? Like, It's helpless almost, isn't it? You, that's the, that's the, the bit I'm getting here. Is it's so helpless that yeah. you, you just... What what can I do? First thing, get yourself orientated. Well, you're still mentally healthy. We all here, all the survival experts, and it's true. It, the longer you leave things, the less you're going to get done. The more weaker you become mentally. When you're fresh and you've got that fight survival mode yeah. set, Get your orienteering done, the layout of the prison, where you know what to do, timings if need be, and get yourself into some sort of routine. So understand how your life needs to be. Yeah. To get day to day running done. Yeah. Yeah. You've been in the army. You've lived in the desert in Afghanistan for three weeks. You can do this. At least you've got a roof over your head. Yeah. 
and you haven't got a camel spider trying to attack you. Well, that's a positive for us, yeah, isn't you've it? Got, <laughs> you've got rats and cobra snakes cutting about, but never mind. <laughs> Take one and you know, the other. But honestly, like, what an experience. Yeah. Like, I don't come from a, a overprivileged lifestyle, family, etc. We all know what hard times are. But this was lower than whale shit level list. Yeah, this yeah, was yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your, your life's just been stripped away before you and you you're now a, a number. You've a prison number. That's what you are. Yeah. And you you've just gotta keep keep plugging away. Every day is groundhog day. All the time the every you know, you try and make a day as good as best as you can. But it's when them doors shut again and the clacking of the the lock and the that's when it all comes back, the pain, the suffering, the the sleepless nights. Go to sleep with the tears streaming down your eyes because you don't want to show weakness in front front of the others by crying. Yeah, I'm 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 no I'm not the only one who did that. Don't care how, how tough you are, you'll have shed a tear in that. Yeah. You, you know, you've just had your life just ruined in an instant. You know, you've got to just put what you know, but take what you, training you've got military-wise and implement that in your day-to-day life, and and that's how it has to be. And So at what point did you start getting a bit of light at the end of the tunnel? When did you find out, you know, when did they sentence you, for instance? When did you start thinking, you know, get your head around how long you're going to be there? Well, we got charged for weapons and all that after, like, four months. And then we got bail July, uh, no, sorry, bail April 2014. And that was it. Stringent bail conditions, signing at the police station twice daily. That went on for where were you staying in a, in a... just in a in a hotel paid by the company and then they decided to just default on the payments and then we got kicked out so it was fend fend for myself so i'm not earning and now my family's got to make sure that i've got a roof over my head and to survive because okay. there was no help from the british government it's not part of their protocol so what are you doing just try and find yourself dig somewhere yeah and that was, I mean, that's just... So me and one of our Brits and two of our Estonians kind of together, but that kind of breaks up because as time goes by, the frustration, people start falling out, which you're missing your family. That's where the anger stems from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, you're basically, you're free, but you're not. You've got the, the freedom of movement, but you, it's like an extended holiday. Yeah, it's somewhere, in somewhere you don't want to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of them holidays. I know where I want to be. But, yeah, it was like, you're, you're in, so you just try and make do. Yeah. Try and learn the layout of the land. Um. So this goes on for a while. This goes on for a while. And then uh, paperwork, all this court hearings. It, the case goes all the way up to Supreme Court. You've got the police, you've got our lawyer, the Estonians got their lawyer, but they're, the thing about India, it's all a caste system. Our lawyer was more experienced, but their law, the Estonian lawyer was higher caste, so he was able to talk before our lawyer. So the police are saying that you've got illegal weapons, blah, blah. We've turned around and said, no, we're just getting provisions. That's because that's all the judge wanted. And then all the Estonian's lawyer had to say was the guys were on the vessel is uh, crew members and we were waiting on fuel and provisions. And that probably would have been the end of it. But he turned around and went, I don't know why the ship was there, blah, blah. But the, the lawyer just, the judge has just heard. I don't know why they were there and forget everything else. That was meaningless. He, he got his answer there. So he was like, wait, if you're saying that, you're saying that and you're saying that, we need to have a trial. 
and we went it's going back to the lion's den so this went all the way up to new delhi when we were out of prison and that's we could have been home that christmas 2015 no let's start a trial we would have been probably home in the, in the summer so this trial started september going down from chennai to to the Korean, nine hour nine and a half hour bus journey uh now and again uh i told the lawyer i said look i've got a i met a girl out there and i'm staying in chennai i'm not coming down unless the judge wants us to come i said the reason being when they were cross-referencing uh all like the the weapons expert who only fired two rounds through to and he went well it's not auto, it's not an automatic weapon the collector of evidence didn't even wait for his report and just put the charges on me and when he's getting cross-referenced in a court of law and you're hearing this when it gets translated i felt ill mm. i went that's perjury you've just lied in a court of law but i will just take your first statement anyways he, he went, I wouldn't have put the charges on the men if I'd seen the ballistics expert report. I went, but you put the charges on wi- without seeing it. You made, you made our life hell. Yeah. And I, I went, I can't deal with this. I felt like strangling them. I bet you did, yeah. It's it was just, like yeah. disgusting, you know. And then that was to and fro, and it got to Christmas. And we had the two weeks uh, recess. We had a little meeting with our lawyers and they went, look, we've done everything. They couldn't even prove where the vessel was. We never lied. We never, all this rumour saying, oh, we were in, we were, said we're in international waters. We weren't. We were in their waters. But there was a reason why we were in their waters. Yeah, because it is. Due to the cyclone. Yeah, the cyclone, yeah. The maritime law saved us but they didn't they couldn't even on a map we said show us where where we were and they were like oh couldn't so what what brought the resolution around and when did you first start thinking right we are going to get we are going to get home from this what 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 was the catalyst for it to start going right for you it's not a nice thing to say but the captain his health deteriorated he got bone cancer Okay. And when we were in prison, after you know, because we got we got convicted, you know, for, sentenced for five years, which would be on top of the time that we've already done, and that was the that was about uh, the three year point. So you got another five years, so that would have been eight in total. Yeah, and wow. I had a I had the media ringing us, and then we're all stood at the back of the court. Judges, guys, stand up, say something. Madame Q Branch disappears. Our embassy staff straight on their phone because they could understand Tamil. You know who they were ringing. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I've, I've seen some scared people, like, you know, when you're in Afghanistan and Iraq, but I've never seen a lawyer so petrified as our lawyer was when you had to tell 35 men, you're not going home for Christmas, you're going to prison for five years it was ill I was ill so I had to tell my family that and after hear my mum screaming like a wounded animal on that phone again having to do that phone call and it's it destroyed me but you, you've got you've, you've done it before you can do it again five years and where were you going to do that five years? You went, you went back to prison? Went back to Chennai, so went next door to Central Prison 1. Was it any better than the Raman prison? It was a lot better. Okay. Still t- still difficult, still have sure, to Hong learn Jin everything Jin. again, but yeah. a, a, a lot better. Hardened criminals because they've been uh, convicted and all that. You know, we saw one guy with his throat slit, blood everywhere. Guards couldn't care going around hitting them with latty sticks. You know, it's mental, man. There's no there's no law over there. 
they do what you, they didn't we you know didn't get any injuries or anything like that just I let my emotions get the best of me and I kicked off in the hospital and it all turned into a massive brawl and the superintendent she was a bit worried for our safety so she put one a, a lockdown so yeah everyone was quite happy with me we just wanted to get escorted so for about three months no one would speak to us I felt a right outcast and I apologised. I said, let, let, I let my emotions get the best of us. What do you expect? We're all in this together. We're all in this together, whether you like it or lump it. But we've all got to keep our head on my shoulders and keep plodding to that light at the end of the tunnel mm. because the amount of times it got so bright and they just moved it and it went dim in a, in a heartbeat. It takes it out of you mentally. Yeah, I'm sure it does. This yeah. is just pure mental torture, not physical, mental. When, yeah. when it's physical torture, your mind can tell your body to stop feeling pain after a certain length of time. Who tells the mind to stop feeling pain? It, you know, so as time goes by, we had our court case for our an appeal stuck at the high court. The judge refused to make a decision for one year. So we were like, because our court is different. Our lawyers can probably approach differently. In India, it's not as simple, which is strange because they mirror our courts like ours, mm. but they'd still put their little spiel on things. So our, our captain was ill with bone cancer. That was confirmed. He, lo he just looked like a bag of bones with skin. He looked ill. I thought, this man's going to die in here. And I always said, if if one of us dies or is seriously injured, that'll be our freedom. I'm 100%. But I had already told my family in letters and myself, five years. Anything, pre anything before five years is a bonus. My mind, I'm doing the five years. Simple as that. Get that out the way. Anything before, it's a bonus. Yeah. Um. And we'd already been told in the previous time we're getting released, packed all our belongings, and the jailer was lying up. Another mental head fuck. That's, that's outrageous. Everyone, we're all packed our belongings. And the superintendent came down. He was like, what are you all doing? We're, we're getting bail, he said. No, no, I didn't say nothing. Like, go on, off your pop, back to your cell. Wow. Uh, that is that, just... And that just... Boom! Yeah. Blokes were destroyed. Because that's what lying can do to you in that yeah, situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Built you up and just... Uh, you know, I know that feeling of waiting for that key every time the, every time the door goes. Every time mm. you hear that clunk. Yeah. You know, every time it's like you, you, you almost react like that every time. Like, Am I going? Yeah. Is it good news? What's happening now? That's what, what it was like. Yeah, every time that door yeah. went or someone came... You, you hope it might be good yeah, news yeah, or yeah, some yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. news. Um, sometimes it was just, right, the embassy's here or, or you've got a visit. You know, I was uh, thankfully gr very grateful. My sister came to see us. She always picked my birthday. So my birthday's in March. So I spent I spent three birthdays and Christmases in prison. So that's when I saw uh, the, the, the last time I was begging her to bring my dad because I was never going to see my mum. And my dad's 77 now, so at the time he was, you know, 70 kind of thing, 70-something. And I was like, I need to see at least one of them. Because what if their health deteriorates so bad with this situation they can't fly? Mm. And he, so my me, me dad literally lifted my spirits up. Because we, we, we were waiting for the judge to make a decision. And it wasn't. They don't care. I, they don't I went care. to the embassy in London with your sister, mm. and I remember them coming on the doorstep. They were like, no, "What do you want from us? Can, I, the, 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 can was, somebody uh, please?" Yeah. Yeah, horrendous. It was. It was absolutely horrendous. And our lawyers said, "Right, we'll do a red heron. We'll see if we can get the captain released, so his family from the Ukraine can come and." 
watch him die, basically. He was getting treatment. At the time, uh, Ark... So, he's, we're stuck at the high court. He's went through the lower courts to high court. And it went up to Mr. Chief Justice of India himself in New Delhi. The grandest judge of all. Heard his case and went, Why are these still in my country? I want a decision in two weeks now. Because when, when they said about his case, our oh, legal team went, Excuse me, do you uh, see about what's happening in your high court, Your Honour? They're refusing to give a decision. And that was the cap, that was what started things. And that's when that bright tunnel light is blinding you. It was just like, you'd think it, it was like, wow. It's on like Donkey Kong now. It's <laughs> on like Donkey Kong. We've now got two weeks. Can't imagine what's happening back in the UK. Probably headless chickens, because they know. But we've all been here before. Yeah. We've all been here and felt the pain and misery when it's not gone your way. Yeah. So, in a way, we are excited but we're being a bit level-headed here. We're thinking because you know, it's like an on the truck, off the truck. It could, and they could just literally go, "Gotcha." Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. It's again, it? Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of basically we're thinking, mm. and then it got to the day, right? Monday, the day of the races, twenty uh, seventh, twenty no, twenty sixth of no- November. Monday, and I've, I mentioned this many times, and it actually came on me playlist when I was driving down. Uh, we're all sitting in the prison uh, cell on a Sunday night. We couldn't sleep because we know you know, court's happening on Monday. But f- before lights out, we had the radio on and had power ballads on, and uh, one of the songs... I like the song anyways, but it, it means so much to me now for what it uh, symbolises. And it's the song, The Final Countdown, from Europe. Okay, yeah, 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 and then when that song, The Final Countdown, came on, I stood up in the cell and I went, that's it. It's over the morrow. And I, you get a few up, uh, you know, a few people go, oh, don't, we'll see. What... I was, my mind, that song, I went from zero to 100, we're getting out. That's it. We are home for Christmas. That's it. And ah, uh, and I, no, no, no one could sleep that night. As soon as that, that door was open, the card was nearly getting booted out of the way, <laughs> so I could go to our little makeshift gym just to try and tire myself out because we didn't yeah. know when our case was going to be heard. Yeah, so you got no no chance of knowing what what time of the day. So we we waited till around lunchtime. When the guys went down to the jailer, see if they could ring the lawyer. She says, it hasn't been heard, but just to let you know, there's 40 court cases. You're the last one. Uh, we were like, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Keep no, the best. Didn't, didn't let you down. Didn't let me down. <laughs> you know, so we're definitely getting heard. She says, yes, you're definitely getting heard. And... I thought, right, okay. So the guys went to the uh, kitchen, started making some food. I went out into the uh, wait, outside under the mango tree where where little Jim was, and I was just doing some exercises. And it was literally our cell behind our, in our compound where the the gym was. So normally they would just check to see if anyone was out and just say, "Oh, by the way, food's here." And uh, Paul came to the window. And you know when someone's excited, but they want to cry at the same time, they're full of jubilant, um, that words are just covered with emotions. And he went, Dunny, Dunny. I went, what? He went, yeah. it's over. Case acquitted. It's over. Like, and, he, and I was just like that. See, I told you. I told you. Because, <laughs> you know, 
And I was just like, right, okay, let's just crack on here. Let's just finish off my workout. <laughs> and I was like, nah, yeah, fuck, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, so I went back, I went into the uh, cell, and you could see the spirits of the guys. But they were like, right, we're getting this. Let's see what happens. We're, uh, nothing's going to happen today. Blokes were just packing their bags and everything, whatever bag they had. You know, I uh, had a little mini suitcase because obviously when uh, family come and bring the bring you you know little goodies, which was you know they could they could have just said you can't have, but yeah. with the help of the embassy, we were allowed certain certain comforts. Yeah. Um, I didn't bother packing nothing because I thought, hey, it's no point. We've been here. We've been here before. Till I walk out them gates. That's when I'm out of prison. Not, I'm not going to think. So whenever I slept again, that's two days with no sleep. You live, you, you, you know, you run a high. So I'm going around and I say, Paul, I said, where are you off to? This is the next day. He goes, oh, I've been summoned to the superintendent. I went, all right, okay. And so I'll do a, like a, my little ex- my little uh, circuit training, and I'd walk around the compound again. And as I was coming round again, Paul was coming back in. And I said, oh, what's 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 Fatty had to say? And he goes, Embassy's coming at 11 o'clock, get your, get your bags packed. He said, and honestly, I, I stopped. Yeah. It was like winning the lottery. Yeah, I bet you absolutely. It felt like someone had just took yeah, my kneecaps yeah, yeah, yeah. away. I was wow. like, oh. And I was like, I, I'm not believing it. I was the last to pack my bags and go down. Everyone had gone there, 11 o'clock embassy. And I got down there. The high commissioner was there. The deputy high commissioner was there. The two girls were there. And I was buzzing. I was like, I'm going home. I'm going home. This is real. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is real. Even that the director of prisons was there. The superintendent came from uh, home because she was she was not long had her babies. They knew we weren't meant to be there. Well, you weren't. No, <laughs> you weren't the, meant to be there, were you? The the prison wasn't were enemy. Yeah. The the weren't. It was the police, the government of Tamil Nadu was were enemy, not the prison. And you learnt you 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 later found that out, and then you get out, you get into that air conned vehicle, and you you like I have, and then they give you a nice cold drink which you've never had for nearly two years, and it just hits, and you cry, yeah, because you 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 just feel like, whoa, what's just happened here, but I still went. It's not over. I'm not home yet. I'm not trusting these bastards. This could be another trick. But let me, the only number I could remember, because I had all my stuff, at, you know, with the embassy. And I rung my sister. I said, it's me. Like, she's going to know it's me. An unknown number. So... I went, it's Nick, I'm out. And me, me, I think my sister Nanny deafened us, screaming. She says, I'm on the way, I'm on the way to the airport, I'm coming to get you. And I was like, she's even coming to get us. She's even coming to yeah. get us to bring us home because she doesn't trust me, me to come back myself. Well, she couldn't let me bring us back because uh, the way... Th- the embassy and all that and the documentation took another like like a couple of days to get all the paperwork a week of no sleep i was living on i was living on fumes yeah i was i was <laughs> i was on fumes yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah i was yeah, just yeah. like get me on that plane and uh i picked my flight to where i'd only stay two hours in dubai and it, I hit on, and I was I was showing the embassy, um, my flights because uh, 
they were they were taken care of by the mission to seafarers. You know, they were amazing support the mission to seafarers. So was so many, including yourself, um, immense support for not just my family but all of our families. And they paid for a few nights in the Radisson Blue because we deserved it after going through hell. We deserved a little just bit of luxury. <laughs> it was all right eating the first bit of meal. It just went straight through. You know, a bit of rich food. Yeah. Eating slop, eating, you know, Big Bob's Bastard Stew. We called it for 92 years. I'll never <laughs> eat a stew ever again. But uh, my sister came out. She stayed at the same uh, hotel, the Radisson Blue. Um, the... It's just a couple of days getting everything sorted and then basically said you can't get that flight you need to go now my sister had her flight was a little bit earlier yeah so she had to go so i couldn't get her flight even though there were seats uh, it was too too soon to get me on that flight and they went the embassy girls said said were kind of years all you need to leave tonight every one of you it was basically they've had they've had a chewing off from higher authorities and then they, they want some scalps back and they're basically saying right get out of this country now so if people have, people have said to us would you ever go back to india i'm probably never allowed to <laughs> would you want to no <laughs> <laughs> no. no chance. I've I don't want to go there now because you. I've, I've always <laughs> wanted to go and see the Taj Mahal, but I'll, yeah. I, I don't think I'll, I'll. I'll just watch it on a on a TV. Uh, but yeah, and then get get to the airport. Uh, it was hard heartbreaking because my sister was already flying back. Me my partner at the time she came. She was devastated because she was like am I ever going to see you again kind of thing but she'll always remain in my heart even though we're not together uh, for what you've done uh, I thank her from the bottom of my heart as I do with everyone and then you get on that flight four hours they must have they must have just rammed the heating on I was in a sweat box for four hours got to Dubai no phone, no money, apart from I was able to get like an Americano, Americano, which lasted us seven hours. <laughs> I was sipping it. I was thinking, please don't fall asleep. Because I've literally not slept for nearly a week. I'm thinking, don't you, you're on your last hurdle. Don't you dare miss your freaking <laughs> flight. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, man. <laughs> that that would have gone down like a ton of bricks, but. Got on the flight to Dubai, for, to to Newcastle from Dubai, and I I have to say thank you to Emirates. I had my own trolley dolly. She she was amazing, but it, they kept it under wraps. But when I got on that flight, you could tell I had long hair. I looked lost. The last time I was on a plane was September two thousand and thirteen. I, I stood out like a sore thumb. I looked like a bag of shit. And there was a few people that obviously recognised us. They didn't disturb us. They just did the welcome home voice. And, you know, uh, and it only made us choke on the plane because they knew what it symbolised me coming home. They didn't want to disturb us. And I was hanging out. It let me... I was hanging out and yeah. for all the dreams I had, every dream was different. But one thing that always was the same in every dream when I used to dream about coming home when I was in prison was when the captain says, right, can you return your seats, buckle up, we're coming into such and such airspace, we're preparing to land. I was, I was watching Dunkirk and I was like in and out of, Sleep, I was I was exhausted. I was literally, that's it. Wake us up when we to when we land, and uh, 
when the captain said that, you'd have thought someone just put a fresh battery in us. I was like, that's bosh. I know what's coming. <laughs> I know what's coming. And then you're looking out the window and you can see, because where the, the airplane comes, it passes near where I live. And I could see certain landmarks. landmarks. Yeah, 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 yeah. You recognise, yeah. And I was like that. Yeah, we'll go. I was like that. And the we landed. The trolley dolly says, do you, do you mind staying back? Just we'll get everyone off. I can't imagine how it is for you. I went, okay. And uh, everyone got off. Captain came out, shook all their hands. And I tell you what, I stood at the top of them stairs and I took one hell of a breath of fresh, clean, crisp December air. And I tell you what, my lungs had a fit. And the the baggage handlers were welcome home. I've only fell down the stairs with emotions. And then I got on the bus and they're all stuck. I was like, sorry, sorry for keeping you this weight. And they were like, oh, don't worry. This is for you. This is for you. And we literally just went, eh? got off. One of the uh, ladies from Newcastle Airport picked us up. And I, like I say, I said thank you to the Mission to Seafarers. Thank you uh, for prisoners abroad. Thank you for Emirates. But it's now to say thank you to Newcastle Airport for what they did. And literally, they must have told the baggage handler, get on that flight, get his bag now. Because the carousel hadn't started. My bag was stood there waiting. The, the lady took us, went through immigration. I was thinking, I could have brought loads of tabs back. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only, you, know, I, smokes, you yeah. know what I mean I, I've just <laughs> lost four years in my life I've just I'm knackered and the first thing I th when I walked past because there was no one there no one there I went I could have brought loads of ciggies back me <laughs> and then she got to the doors and she says this is a journey just for you and she walked you'd think it was an easy Easy thing for something that I've been re having sleepless nights preparing myself was nothing to take away from how I felt trying to walk through them doors. Something that should have been so easy was like it felt like doing pay company all over again. Hard. I couldn't do it. I, I prepared myself and I, I I tried and I couldn't. I couldn't even take that first step. And then all the other people started coming and a guy came and he opened the door and I saw loads of media on the right-hand side and I, I saw my family and friends but my mum in a wheelchair to the left and the door shut and I was like, compose myself. And I was ready to start and then another guy and it opens. And when that opens, because they're waiting, they, they know the flight's landed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're waiting on me. My, my dad turns, he says, he's there, he's there. And for anyone who hasn't seen the video of me come home, please watch it because... Yeah, that's when you see emotions and what it means to a family knowing that a nightmare's over. Mm. And you can see that me and my sister come together and it was just unbelievable. The support that people showed me, you know, the media, you know, everyone's got their own uh, views of the media, but the way the media assisted and helped my family and how they dealt with my interviews there was no pressure there was no you know their typical media it, it, they were really good and it it just hit me i'm home mm. i'm i'm home it's crazy the nightmare is over begin to imagine what it the nightmare is like, over so i do my media 
Um, and I say h hello to everyone, and you know, it's it's strange because it's so quiet. India's bustling the life. It's very busy. Their roads tooting the horns, and we had like a local biker gang who supported with four four X. They were our escort, yeah. and they were cutting up, stopping traffic on roundabouts, and we literally had a free pass from the airport to home. Didn't even stop unless it was a red light. It was just amazing what they did. It it, it felt like I was royalty, but it, it felt so eerie. It felt weird. I wasn't used to this. I was in a fighting survival mindset, yeah. and... I'll, I'll, I've mentioned it before, but I, I, the first thing I noticed was people in my mental health. And because I was so naive at the time, and I was thinking, why is everyone being weak as piss? You know what I mean? But I tell you what, that was all to come. That was all to come for me. Yeah. You know, and. Did, did it all sort of like catch up with you slowly? And, you know, you started to. Because you look back on these things, don't yeah. you? Things start to dawn on you after a while. Yeah, you go, yeah. Bit close that was. Um, and then you go, wow, that was pretty insane. Do you know what I mean? And you start to... It, you People keep saying to me this thing, it unravels, doesn't it? Yeah. It, so the it, whole thing's in you at the moment. You're yeah. home, you're the, and, then, and then all of a sudden you go... I, like, I didn't know how I was going to act, how I was going to unravel, as you just said, People, people know me. My family know me. I'm a little hothead. I lose me shit at the least bit thing. I was losing me shit try, just trying to find where you were <laughs> before <laughs> coming here. Um, but yeah, I felt like I was all right. Um, people were buying me loads of drink, and my dad was drip feeding it. He, he, not that, that doesn't bother me. No, I was never gonna, cause. The worst had happened. The worst had happened, mm. so I wasn't gonna just sit and just drink and see the bottom of a bottle. You know, things was happening. I was doing interviews and stuff like this and that, it, and things was good. But you know that doesn't always last forever. And when the dust starts to settle, like it took three years for me to have a breakdown. Because when you're in that fighting survival mindset, the demons can't get you because you're too powerful. They wait till you're vulnerable at time of peace when you least expect it. And I'm a big, big believer. And when I say this is you need to know your own signs of your decline. Mm. I've learned mine. And yes, I may, there might be something else, but it's other people who pick up on your actions as well. And I was noticing me and my sister, the, the, the person that I was against her, was arguing with her, now this is not right. She's just saved my bacon. She's just done what you would you would think a brother and a sister and relationship sister would have. Incredible. Your, she your she went incredible. beyond. She yeah. didn't just focus on me. Yeah. She focused on all of her. Yeah. You know, I, she, you know how she kept it all together. A family dealing with me, mum. Me. She deserves her weight in gold. She should have a medal for her acknowledgement and helping and stuff like this. But she just did it because she knew I was innocent. And I'm in our throat, and I think this this isn't right, and you don't realise. And then I, I start declining, and it just hits you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here anymore. This isn't my life. My life's ruined. It's like I felt like I was trapped in the past, and I'm. This is like a new chapter, but. I was scared to turn the page because it wasn't over. And then this just taken me and I, I indirectly uh, took help. 
and the people's support was fantastic. I, f I was always, because that's a, the first thing I noticed when I came out, people with their mental health. I didn't want to be one of those who jumped on the bandwagon. Not that I technically jumped on the bandwagon after three years, but when things is going on in your life, you're keeping the demons away. Yeah, You're preoccupied with other things. But it hits you. And by God, it hits you. You're powerless. You think you're Mr. Tough Guy. You th Whatever. When your mind goes against you, you've got no one to talk to. You, you feel people are against you. you it's, it's horrible experience. You just think, why is my life crumbling from the inside out? My head's just ready to just blow up. Every time I saw me, ma'am, it came back. Because I used to say, they've caused her to be like that. So I was never escaping it. Mm. I've, as in time, I have learned to live with it. There's nothing I can do to change what's happened to me, ma'am. But at that time, that's all I cared about. And it hits you. Mm. And you, I take the, the, you know, the help from the walking with the wounded. Absolutely fantastic what they've done. Did some token therapy, medication. You know, you, you don't always be on one medication. You've got to find what works for you and et cetera. And, and I'm just trying to integrate back with life. And then things starting to happen. We're going to lockdown and all that. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, we'll go again. At least this time, it's not a prison. It's like a sanctuary. I've got everything I need. So, but it's, you know, and I was I was working, so it wasn't as bad as what uh, others may have uh, experienced. And it just comes again. But worse, you actually do something. The day b last year, you know, the day before me, me dad's birthday, but it's all right for people to turn around and say, Pick up the phone. Make the call. That's like taking a horse to water and forcing it to drink. It just doesn't work like that. I was talking to my friend. As soon as that phone call ended, that was it. I had an out-of-body experience. I could see myself. And I was powerless. I could see myself at the edge of my bed undoing all the tablets and just, and just, I was lower than whale shit. I didn't want to be here. I felt I could keep the demons at bay. And you can't. You've got to let them take a hold of you and meet somewhere in the middle. But I didn't get that far. I just said, consume me. I didn't want to be here. I kind of was letting the, the cat out of the bag. My sister went into sis, sister mam mode, alerted me dad. My dad came, and I was in my dressing gown, comatose, in and out of consciousness, on my bed, and I could hear my dad flapping like a budgie on the phone of the paramedics. And, he's, and he was like, 45 minutes, and get him there in 15. And he was trying to help us down the, the stairs because I live in an upstairs flat. Mm. I was like, just edging away. And then as soon as he got me in, in his passenger seat, they screeched around the corner and then they got us transferred, blues and twos, straight to the hospital and just did all what was necessary. They kept us in all day because of the nature of the tablets. My mum, her medication was quite it's quite funky. So I had to make sure, doing blood tests, ECGs and all that, make sure that was... You were going to lapse back into it. Yeah. yeah. Make sure that there was no internal damage, and then I I can be released from uh, hospital. But like, it was a wake up call, and I never want to experience that ever again. I've had me down days since then. Yeah. 
but never to that point. Never to the point where I, I just want to... Because my me, me sister says, look, if you do that, you may as well put a gun to mum and dad's head and pull the trigger. Because that's exactly what you'll do to them if you take your own life. Some people need butter, you know, buttered up, wool around them. Some people need the truth. Yeah, I think, I, I think the truth is an absolutely imperative part of people's lives because if you if you you keep just telling yourself lies, it don't work. You, does it? You, some people don't like it because yeah. it's upsetting. Yeah, but that's when you it's can not, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. "I need to do something about my life." Yeah, yeah, I need to take action. I say the truth hurts, but it does hurt. But it you does. know, sometimes it's it's necessary to be hurt, isn't it? Be, because you don't think of no one else. You're very selfish. You think of your mission and your mission alone. You don't care about the fallout. You're not going to be there. Mm. And then because I had that saving grace, and Lisa had to say that to me. It was it, to picture putting a gun to you. Be, picture you being forced to put a gun to your mum and dad's head and pull the trigger. Yeah, it's not a picture you want, is it? No. And that's when you've got to take actions, and that's when you've got to assess the situation, address it, and take the help that's necessary. And I'll urge anyone who is suffering, make the call. Don't wait for that, no, that day that might not come. Because that next day could be no, your last. Very, very, you know, that is that is the advice. That is, you know, that is that's never it's, a true word spoken. It, no, your, your friends and family will get on you and you'll feel like that of being an irritating bastard. That's because they care. Yeah. No, and you're they don't right. want to see you destroy yourself. So, what are you up to now? Oh. Well, Obviously, hey. you've, written, you've written your book. Yeah, yeah. That, that uh, is a good little achievement. It's quite good quite cathartic it was the first time I ever like sat down and lived it again mm. you know um, did you find it quite an experience writing that was it yeah it, it's you know you've been very animated here in the way you've told your story and I can imagine you telling this oh yeah when you're in, 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 in much a similar way to yeah, how you, yeah. you've been today I, you know I, I tell it how it is I don't sh I don't you know bullshit baffled brain I don't sugarcoat I tell it as raw as I can I tell it, you know, how I believe the reader would want to read the book. They want to yeah. know. Um, and the amount of books I read in prison, the the main brunt of the book, uh, the story was at the beginning. So that's when you read my book, chapter one is it starts in the courtroom, yeah. getting sentenced to five years. And then, and then you go, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. You go yeah. All born, the born way back. Somebody did a similar yeah. sort of thing. It, it, it concentrated. It was mind opened in a big firefight in Gaza. Yeah, Do you know. And then it sort of like went back. How did he get here? Where did he it's come from? It's basically like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a biography yeah. in a way. Yeah. And it's got chapters of uh, Lisa in there as well. So it's not just my account. It's got my sister's accounts, yeah, so which proud. gives you a, a perspective from the my family what it was like on their side during the four years ordeal. Yeah. Um. It was, it was hard trying to go through it all. It was really, really hard. Um, it, it, you know, it is what it is. You're there. I am. I am. It's there now. I, you know what I mean? It's, it's, something, it's something to be proud about. You know, everyone. I believe everyone's got a story. It's just some people are prepared to tell them, and others aren't. Uh, but yeah. Nick, I think you've got an absolutely amazing story, mate. The way you come across, you know, you're inspirational to a lot of people. Well, I, I think, I just, I think I just your try. work here on this planet is 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 being done every day, and people that pick this up, you know, that's that's going to help well, people I hope so. in their own I, life. And I've the way said you know, that. when this goes out, I'm sure people will watch this. They'll relate to what you've said. And for me, you know, it is inspirational, and it and and you have a story which needs to be heard and told. Well, and thank so, you. Look, I can't thank you enough for coming. I hope you'll come into the studio again at some point and maybe we'll do some other stuff. Oh, definitely. But, you know, for now, uh, Nick, thanks so much for coming, no buddy. All right, it's, it's been a pleasure.
it's been a pleasure right to have you